Okay, so today is 2-24-16. Um, a couple of notes. So we've been talking about your population modeling stuff that you did with the lions. You got those turned in. You'll get your grades back on those later today. Um, on your vocab packet, the last four words, I think it's number 18 through 21. Is that correct? Oh, okay. We'll talk about that one also. We've talked about that but um, you may not have caught it. We'll go back to it. Hold on. Um, those last four words, we're not going to do that section of this chapter. Um, we're going to pick that back up after the air test in the spring. So we're going to stop at basically 20. Um, we're going to stop this chapter at 20-2, and we're not going to go into 20-3, which is the, all the stuff about human population. We'll reference it real briefly, and then we're going to just cut it off there. Okay, so um, you looked yesterday at exponential versus logistic growth. You looked at population um, limiting factors, density dependent and independent. And now we're going to talk a little bit about just sort of how these populations fluctuate. And fluctuation, remember, is sort of changes, you know, continual state of change. If something, we'll sometimes say, you know, something is in flux. It's fluctuating. Um, gas prices fluctuate. Populations fluctuate. Um, your grades may fluctuate wildly. I've had students who had wild fluctuations from Ds to Bs and Fs to As and, you know, crazy stuff. So very often those population fluctuations are actually due to some factor in the environment. If we think about... Um, if we, if we think about the rat population, it fluctuates. You know, you've got little micro fluctuations. Then every 48 years, you get a giant spike. Then you have a crash. Then you have little fluctuations again. And 48 years later, you have a giant spike and a crash. That's fluctuation. And it's tied to a factor in the environment. What factor is it tied to? The rat population does this, boom. Looks like a heartbeat, actually. Wouldn't that be 96? You know, if we call this year zero. What is it, what is that um, spike in the rat population tied to? Well, it, it experiences exponential growth for a little period, but why does it experience exponential growth? What environmental factor causes the rats to have that population spike? What about the bamboo? Yeah, when it produces fruit, when there's this abundant food source. So suddenly they have a great food source, their population soars, the food source goes away, it crashes. There's an environmental, and we could graph, we could put on the same graph, bamboo fruit availability. And what would we see? We would see a line that looked like that. Why is the line for bamboo a little bit ahead of the line for the rat population? Why is that happening just before the line for the rat population? Yeah, the rats can't reproduce. So the second that first bamboo fruit hits the ground is the second that the rats suddenly have that extra calorie source. Prior to that bamboo fruiting, they don't have any extra calories. They're still existing down in this sort of just steady little fluctuations. But right after the bamboo starts to flower, the rat population starts to climb. And then after that bamboo fruit availability diminishes, that's when the population crashes. So the one thing always lags a little bit behind the other because it's dependent on the other. We can think about that dependent-independent here again. The rat population is dependent on the availability of bamboo fruit. If we look at this image, and this is one that you reproduced from your book, so you should have this as part of your drawings that you can use to study from. This is a classic... Um, this is cited in all kinds of biology textbooks. It's a classic example. 
So, do you know what a snowshoe hair is? We do not have them here. No? Okay, it's a rabbit. Um, it's a rabbit that's found in the far north. So, like, if you go up into northern Canada, um, I think northern Europe has snowshoe hares. And the neat thing about snowshoe hares, um, who here has a dog? Nobody? A few people? Okay. Does your dog's coat change from summer to winter? Do they grow in a winter coat? Some dog species do it more, it's more obvious than others. Like, German shepherds are, are notorious. Um, and any dog that's got some shepherd in them, well, very often their coat really thickens up in the winter, and then in the spring they shed like crazy. They call it blowing coat, and huskies do it too. Um, so some species have different fur, summer and winter. Snowshoe hares are an extreme example of that. That's the big special thing about snowshoe hares, is they completely change their color. In the summer, they're these little brown bunnies, just like a rabbit you might see around here in eastern cottontail. In the winter, they grow a white coat. So what's the advantage? Camouflage, yeah. They're well hidden in the winter. They're, so basically what you had is at some point you had rabbits whose winter fur was growing in lighter. More of them survived to reproduce, and the population favored a rabbit that actually does a color shift, or evolution favored a rabbit that actually does a color shift and has a totally white winter coat. So these, these creatures live in regions where there is snow cover on the ground all winter. Um, you know, these are not southern species. Do you know what a lynx is? This guy. It's actually like a bobcat. They're like a bigger, shaggier, more aggressive bobcat. So um, imagine your house cat weighing 65 pounds and having much larger teeth. Wow. Um, pretty aggressive predator. So one of the prime food sources for lynx are snowshoe hares. And snowshoe hare populations tend to fluctuate. There are natural fluctuations in the snowshoe hare population. And somebody got the bright idea, and this is, it's, it's a great idea. How do you reconstruct, so we talked about sampling populations to get sizes. How do you get historical population data? This is a, a question that may be near and dear to some of you, because you've recently been looking for historical population data. How could you estimate historical populations? I'll tell you how they did this one. So they took data all the way back to 18, like 1830. They got data for lynx and snowshoe hares. And this was in Canada. What do you know about the history of how Europeans came to Canada? <clears throat> who were the Europeans who really came to Canada first, and why did they come? What was in it for them? So French trappers came to especially Canada for the fur trade, and they trapped as many lynx as they could because lynx have beautiful pelts. They trapped as many snowshoe hares as they could because these are a rabbit with a beautiful, dense, rich coat. And so some biologists went back because those trappers were getting paid for every pelt and somebody was paying them. There were very good records kept. People tend to keep really good records when it comes to making sure they're getting what they're paying for or they're getting paid for what they have. So there were excellent records of the number of lynx pelts and snowshoe hair pelts. And so biologists went through those historical records of pelts collected, and they made estimates of the population. You know, you say, well, if we assume that trappers, you know, took this percentage of the available animals every year, then based on the number of pelts collected, you can, you can make an estimate, and it's only an estimate of how many animals there were. So when they did this, what they found was that, and the, the, the blue line here is the snowshoe hares. Every time snowshoe hares spiked, a few years later there was a spike in the lynx population. And then lynx would really spike and then snowshoe hares would drop. So the food source becomes really abundant. The snowshoe hare breed like crazy. They have more babies. And then when they eat all the rabbits that are there, all the hares that are there, their population crashes. The peril of small population. Um, 
Small populations are constantly at risk of extinction. They're vulnerable to inbreeding, disease, environmental disturbances, and inbred offspring have shorter lifespans, decreased genetic variability, and are more susceptible to diseases. You are going to get a grade for your notes for this chapter, so whatever format you took them on, whether you took them in doceri or on paper or as a slides presentation, um, in notes, and something else, you are going to get some points for having done them this chapter, so, and for, for all chapters from here on out. This beautiful animal, oh, it's not a leopard, it's a cheetah. Um, they're sometimes called the crying cat. You see those tracks down along the side of the nose? Um, you know, there's some sort of African folk tale about how the cheetah got its marks on its face. So, you know, they're the, they're the crying cat, whatever. What's so special about cheetahs, other than they're really, really pretty? Really fast. They are the fastest animal on earth. They are the fastest animal on earth. They, um, once they were able to do slow motion photography, you know, take a film and then slow it down. Um, I mean, it's their their hind legs when they run come way out in front of their back legs. It's like they fold themselves in half and then they launch. I mean, and their their feet are completely off the ground for a lot of their stride. They're amazing. So. They're also probably going to go extinct in the next hundred years or so. Well, that's sad. That'd be great. I, 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 um, Mrs. Hallett and I often talk about how much <laughs> just like the pet things. <laughs> I would love to have a cheetah cub here to play with. Um, wouldn't be a good idea for the cheetah cub or for us, but um, they're beautiful animals. And at some point, in, what was it, in the last 10,000 years. There are fairly old mammal species. Cheetahs had a big crisis. Well, it, this was prior to human hunting pressure. Um, it was disease, I believe, mostly. And I'd have to look it up. Well, when, we do, when we do our genetics unit, we'll talk more about cheetahs because they're a great example of a genetic bottleneck. And you went from having a whole bunch of cheetahs down to having, it's estimated, they can do estimates of how many cheetahs remained. So there were, you know, thousands of cheetahs, and then at one point in cheetah history, there were seven individuals left on the entire planet. Seven individuals left. All cheetahs but seven died. They call that a genetic bottleneck. Are you familiar with the term bottleneck? Okay, um, when we had our first fire drills in the new building, the, the doors at the top and bottom of the stairs were bottlenecks. What does that mean? It's the skinny place. It's where you have a big bunch, and then suddenly it has to narrow down to a little tiny area. We see this on, on roads if you're driving into Columbus or something, and they have lanes closed for construction, and you go from six lanes down to two. That's a bottleneck. Well, cheetahs went through a genetic bottleneck where you had thousands of individuals, and suddenly almost all of them died, and you had seven individuals left. And you said it with the lions. There's a huge risk of inbreeding. What is inbreeding? Well, breeding with close relatives. Yeah. So, you know, when there are only seven of you, you're all going to be reproducing with one another's offspring. And those offspring are pretty much all cousins. And those cousins are all breeding. Cheetahs today, so all the cheetahs that are in zoos in the entire world... You guys all know Mrs. Thomas had a liver transplant, right? So she had a liver transplant. People have organ transplants all the time. They have to take anti-rejection drugs for the rest of their life. Why? Because the body's going to reject that. It's going to take it as a, like a virus or something. Well, it's going to think it's not you. So your immune system's job is to say, okay, this is me. That is not me. So your body comes across a virus or a bacteria or something else, and your body goes, woo, 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 this is not me, this is not me, destroy it. That's what happens. Well, you know, when you've got somebody else's liver in your body, your immune system will go, woo, 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 not me, destroy it, and it will attack the organ because your body recognizes that that's not you. 
every cheetah that's alive on the planet today can receive tissue and organ material from every other cheetah on the planet with no fear of rejection. They are that genetically similar. Siblings. If you have a sibling, you couldn't receive an organ from your sibling without taking anti-rejection drugs. If you need a kidney at some point in your life and your sibling says, yeah, okay, cut me open, I'll give you my kidney, you would have to take anti-rejection drugs because you're different from your sibling genetically. Cheetahs are so alike that their bodies don't even recognize tissue from another cheetah. There's that little genetic variability. So once you have that little genetic variation, if, one, if a disease is going to affect one of them, it's going to kill them all. You know, was it you who said, and I said, well, what's true of when diseases spread? Well, some people get it, some people don't. Right now, I'm knocking on wood as I say this. Have you heard about the second floor plague? You're up here. Oh, no. You wouldn't be here today. This is running three or four... This is, oh, okay. This is running three or four days. Um, it, it involves diarrhea and vomiting. Apparently, it's quite delightful. A number of people have had it. We've had high absence levels. Um, teachers have had it. Kids have had it. Um, pretty nasty stuff. I thus far have avoided it. Um, but some of us get it. Some of us don't. Your immune systems are all a little bit different. You know, that's good. Cheetahs are so similar that anything that's going to affect one of them is going to affect them all, which means they're very vulnerable to going extinct because of that lack of genetic variability. Um, you know, small populations are tough. It's just, it's a tough thing. This is, um, so this, this idea is where we're going to stop. The one thing I am going to put forth to you is this. The, the one last image that I want you to look at. This is human population growth through recorded history. And if you look at it, humans have this pretty steady, gradual increase. There is actually a visible dip there, and that's the Black Plague or bubonic plague. Like I said, killed 60% of Europe, something like that. It was big. And then, what do you have? What kind of growth rate is that? Oh, yeah. So here's the question. What usually happens after exponential growth? At some point, limiting factors kick in. So where does, where does Earth reach the carrying capacity for humans? We've changed the carrying capacity over the span of time. Um, but at some point, does that kick in again? Tomorrow, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do some wrap-up, check-in on vocabulary, and then I'm going to give you a study guide. Your study guides will be due at the end of the period on Friday, so you're going to have two days in class to work on them. I'll give you the key Friday at the end of the period. Monday will be your, rev your quiz, your review. We'll probably do a Kahoot game again. Did you like doing Kahoot better than just regular? Okay, we'll do a Kahoot game again. And um, Tuesday will be your unit quiz on this. We do now have a date for air testing. The biology air test is April 20th. No, April 20th. Yeah, April 20th. So um, that's our drop dead date. That's the date by which we have to have covered all the material for biology so that you're ready to do well and get your ticket punched to get out of high school. So questions, comments, concerns? Okay, awesome.